by singing together 531 all hail the power of jesus name let angels prostrate fall let's stand together to sing it 531 brother bob will lead us all hail the power of jesus name let angels prostrate fall bring forth the royal singing what a day that'll be won't it and uh maybe today uh the lord will come and uh that's all right i'm ready to go and i uh, hope you are too but if and if he came on wednesday night i'd want to be in church you know that and uh i'm glad you're here tonight and uh, looking forward to a good service together let's pray shall we father we bow before you in prayer we thank you for this evening we lord we thank you for the purpose that brings us all together and that's jesus christ and Lord, you promised that when we gather together that you'd be here in our midst, and we believe you are tonight. Thank you for your goodness to us, for your love for us, for your provision, for your protection, all that you do for us, Lord. Thank you for each one that's made their way here to church tonight. I pray, God, that you'll give us exactly what we need this evening. Make this service what you would want it to be. May the songs we sing and the fellowship together, the study of your word, may you use it in our lives to accomplish your will in each of us. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. 491, the Lord's our rock, in Him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. 491, let's sing that first together. The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever He'll be tied, a shelter in the time of time of storm a shade by day defense by night a shelter in the time of storm no fears alarm no foes upright a shelter in the time of storm oh jesus is a rock in a weary land a weary land a weary land oh shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of Good evening. This evening's uh, missionary message 
is from the John Swingle family, missionaries to Russia. Dear friends of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're excited to see the Lord work in the hearts of Russian people. Thank you for your faithful support as we serve in St. Petersburg. 2016 has come to a close and it was by far the most challenging yet to this ministry. We're so thankful for the Lord for blessing our work and allowing us to continue in ministering the gospel to these dear people. For the last eight years at this time of the year, we would report to you on the outreach of the orphans. Every year we would pay a visit to many of the orphanages as possible during the Christmas time. Many of you have helped us in many aspects in purchasing gifts for the children and teachers. For eight years, thousands upon thousands of children and teachers have heard and read of the gospel of Jesus, that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This has been our song, our drive, our message. And we are so thankful for all of you who have prayed and gave us this outreach. Thousands have been reached and some may have been born again. We praise the Lord for allowing us to have this ministry for those years. As said, this year has been the most trying for us. With new anti-terror law that has passed this last summer, we are no longer allowed legally into orphanages without authorized documentation of them being a registered group. So this year, we have not done what we have grown to really love and enjoy for the children. Now we know the Lord has allowed all of this for a reason, and it will not deter our ministry. We are continuing our outreach to people on a more personal level now than before. Our street evangelism has slowed, but only because we need wisdom on how to give out gospel tracts on the street because of the new terror law. The church continues to do well, though we have had what we would deem a setback. It's really not a setback because we have had to exercise church discipline and had a few members removed from the church because of willing sin. So we had a core group of believers and we are so thankful for the Lord of saving them and uniting us. We'd like to ask you to please pray for some of the people to be saved. In our apartment building, we have become friends with a family that lives a few floors below ours. Every Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, we invite our church to our home for preaching, prayer, and fellowship, and of course, some good food. So our neighbors actually ask if they could come this year because last year, as Russian tradition goes, you visit some of your neighbors, bring them a gift, wish them Happy New Year and such. And since our neighbors came to visit us last year, they came into our home and had seen our church people enjoying their time together. And so this year arrives, they wanted to come as well. Praise the Lord. This family came into our home and heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are praying for them, would you? Please pray for Sergi, Katya, and Masha, who are husband and wife and daughter. We would like, to, like for you to please pray for a young mother named Olga. She has made a profession in Christ. She is a single mother with two sons, one of whom is a rebel. Please pray the Lord will continue to give her strength and wisdom and pray for her two teenage sons to be saved, Costa and Pavel. The Lord has brought some of the visitors to church and a young woman named Victoria, who has been fairly faithful. Please pray for her salvation. Also pray for a husband and wife who came to our church for only one Sunday. He is a Russian and she is Chinese. They have been living in China for 14 years. Their niece was a student here at one of the colleges. The poor young lady took her life and her body was found in the frozen waters of the Neva River that flows through our city. Somehow, some way, the Lord brought them to our church and I had preached out of Ecclesiastics chapter three. The gospel was preached and later we took them to lunch and was able to speak further with them. The Lord was opening their hearts because of this reason they have been going through. May God in his good timing save them. Pray for Alexander and his Chinese wife to be saved. On a personal level we, level, we need your prayers for our daughter, Christina. As many of you know, she is handicapped, and with this, she's in need of surgery 
on, on her severe pronated ankles. This may help her in the long run. Also, she has one leg longer than the other, and we're looking into a hip surgery that may help this matter as well. We are not sure when this will take place, but it may this year. Pray for the wisdom, please. Also, I've had to cut my three-month furlough down to only one month. With some changes in the ministry here, I need to return to Russia earlier than I wanted. Lord willing, I will be in the USA for the month of April while my family remains behind in Russia. Thank you again for all your faithful support for all these years. Helping us plant a Baptist church and furthering the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord. Brethren, pray for, pray for us in Christ alone, John Swingle. Zwingles are doing a good job there in St. Petersburg, Russia. And uh, pray for them and uh, continue to pray for the health of their little girl, too. All right, I know they appreciate that. All right, get your uh, prayer guide out if you would. Anybody need one? Anybody not get one tonight? Everybody got covered? Great, good job, fellas. And um, we'll start with the coming events. Pray for the meeting at CRC tomorrow night, the RU Inside. And uh, then Friday night, Reformers Unanimous right here at 7 o'clock. Our normal soul wedding and bus visitation, 10 a.m. on Saturday. Our workers' dinner and workers' meeting, Saturday night, 5 o'clock. If you're not on that list, get on that list. We're buying food, and we want to include you in on it, all right? So uh, get your name on that list. It'll be very helpful. Uh, all you involved in ministry, you should be here. And then if you're not, and you ought to be, you come. And uh, you find where you can get plugged in, all right? It'll be a great night together. Uh, we do have a nursery. We will have a children's program as well. Uh, Brother Hamby will be here. And uh, after the dinner, we come in here for our meeting. He'll take the kids, and he'll run a program for them. Uh, and they'll have a great time that night as well, okay? And uh, then we'll have normal services again on Sunday, 930, 1030, and 630, all right? And on the inside, we praise the Lord for 12 at the RU Inside at CRC last Thursday night, and they had six new guys and one that received Christ as their Savior, and uh, that's a blessing. They were not at London on uh, New Year's Eve day in the morning, so uh, they'll, they'll resume there again this Saturday and start in 2017. I need you to pray for the requests, the different church ministries there, and then, of course, the, the health list and uh, those who are uh, dealing with different health issues and uh, those who just are sick in the congregation right now. Pray what God will heal them and raise them up. We need you to pray for those in authority and remember our military and uh, these who are defending our country. Uh, we pray for these battling cancer. And, of course, we always continue to pray for these on a salvation list. And if you are here and you don't see somebody on there who you used to see on there and you put them on there, if you didn't give us a card with their name on it, then they got taken off. So if you want to see somebody on the list, you fill a card out, put it on there, and we'll add them in for the new year, okay? We pray for the unreached people groups and, of course, our missionaries uh, highlighted uh, by the Zwingle uh, family in Russia. And I'll pray for them this evening, all right? Brother Yoder, I want you to come, if you would, please. And he's going to lead us in our prayer this evening. And uh, be praying for Brother Dave. Brother Yoder will be leaving February 24th. He'll be busy. I don't know how much he'll be here between now and then. Uh, he's got at least six meetings lined up. There. He'll be in churches presenting the work. Uh, then he leaves for uh, India. No, February 8th. He leaves February 8th for India. And uh, he'll be gone just uh, about a month, won't you? because you're going to India, then Armenia. And uh, so uh, be, be praying for that and uh, for his ministry there. But Brother Dave, you lead us in prayer tonight, please. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for another opportunity to speak with you. And we'd ask, Lord, that you would bless our service tonight. We'd ask that you would give us from your word exactly what we need to be better Christians for you. We thank you for the good news concerning Brother Zwingle there in uh, St. Petersburg. We'd ask that you'd help him and give him wisdom concerning the uh, things that have to take place with his daughter with the special needs. We pray that his deputation this time of uh, or furlough would, would be of uh, a huge help to him during the month that he's off. I pray that you would be with Sergi and his family and these people in his church that have uh, various uh, spiritual needs. Lord, I pray that because of the 
government and the influences that, that are in that region, that you would have them draw closer together and be a tighter-knit group than ever before, and that many souls would be saved uh, because of their efforts. Lord, we thank you for uh, allowing us to be a church that is mission-minded, and I pray for these unreached people groups, Lord, that uh, you would send some from the congregations of our church and others uh, to reach these people before it's eternally too late. As we think of uh, 2017, Lord, we'd ask that this would be the year that we would see you come back and, and uh, we'd be together with you in heaven. What a joy that would be. But I pray until then we would be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in your work, and we need your help to do that, so that's what we're praying about. We thank you for those that have been saved this past year, but Lord, there are still many of our loved ones and friends that are on the salvation list, and so we'd ask that they, this would be the year that they would be saved. We thank you for those that have graduated to heaven and those that have come off the cancer list, and we pray that those that are still on this list, that they would be healed, but Lord, more than that, we, we want that your will would be done, whether it be others would be reached because of them, uh, medical staff, whatever the case may be, uh, Lord, I pray that through this uh, you would get the honor and glory in all things. Lord, we'd ask for special protection for our military, those that are holding the ground for us to uh, keep us from being overrun by the enemy. We'd ask, Lord, that you would help them uh, at this time. I pray those that have uh, their Bibles would read them. I pray those that have been witnessed to would seriously consider uh, salvation. Lord, I thank you for those that you have put in authority. Lord, we know that they're put up and they're taken down by you. So we'd ask, Lord, that you would uh, please speak to their hearts, that they would turn from their wicked ways and turn to you. We thank you for the new people that are going to be in office here in just a few weeks. But again, Lord, it's not a, a person uh, or, or somebody's intelligence somewhere. It's all on your shoulders and so we'd ask, Lord, that they would look to you for wisdom. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be born here in America. And I pray, Lord, that we would not stray uh, from your word. We thank you for the health that you've given us to be here tonight. But we would pray for those uh, members of our church that we know and love, that you would help them on a daily basis to get their strength back so that they could be with us. And those that are here with us, Lord, but are suffering from illness, we pray that you would strengthen them. Lord, we thank you for our church and the, the ministries that we have and, and this uh, you know, workers' banquet coming up. We thank you for our pastor that loves you and gives uh, of us all for your work. And we'd ask for those that are involved, our deacons and our Sunday school teachers and bus workers and just every single one of them, Lord. I pray, Lord, that this year... We would do more than ever before, and I'd ask, Lord, that you'd protect them and keep them safe. Lord, that in the midst of our work, we would not uh, slip back and, and fall away from you. Lord, we thank you for the good reports that have, uh, we hear constantly from the, from the prisons and from the RU program. And, Lord, we thank you for those workers that have given of their time to do that. And I'd ask that you'd bless them tonight. Uh, again, Lord, we are so thankful. We're overwhelmed with the blessings that you've given us, and I pray that uh, this coming year we would not be uh, selfish or think that things come because of our own merit, uh, but it all comes from Jesus Christ and him alone. We thank you for him. We would ask this all in his name. Amen. Amen. Would you turn with me in your hymnal to number 191, 191, count your many blessings. Stand with me if you would. 191, let's sing that first together. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, think many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Amen. 
and greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together. course together. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged. God is over all. Let's sing that last together. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged. God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. All right, good singing. You can be seated. Ushers will come and we'll get our offering tonight. This is the first Wednesday night of the month. And give the offering to Brother Yoder for his India trip, and uh, they have a two-week pastor's conference that they'll be doing there. Uh, he and a, a man from Fellowship Baptist Church up in Canton, uh, Doug Fowler, travels with him and uh, helps him in that work, and uh, this uh, uh, pastor over there in India is, is just as excited as he can be to have them come, and he's rounding up all kinds of pastors to be there, and uh, boy, it's going to be a great, great time, and uh, we're excited about that. Uh, so let's uh, let's make sure that they go and they don't want to be an expense at all to the, the home pastor and they don't have much in, in by means anyway. Uh, they sure would like to be a blessing to him. They've asked for Bibles and we're trying to uh, arrange somehow to get some Bibles for them uh, from the India Bible Society over there. Uh, so we uh, we're trying to just asking God if he'd make a way for that to happen so they could give them Bibles. Uh, imagine having a church, imagine meeting like this and 
maybe one person has a Bible and no one else does. Can you imagine that? And uh, it just uh, just so how 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 great it is that we carry a Bible with us to church, and uh, you get to carry one home with you when you go home. And uh, some of you had to decide what one you want to bring when you come to church, and we we're, we're blessed abundantly. And uh, so let's uh, let's give generously tonight to the India trip, shall we? Let's pray together, shall we? Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the privilege to give. And thank you, Lord, for the open door you've given here in the country of India. And, Lord, I'm praying that you'll bless the meeting as it uh, comes in February, Lord, and you'll uh, provide the necessary means for not only the travel and the motels, but, Lord, for the Bibles, for these pastors and for these people. Uh, Lord, make it possible. Provide as only you can. We trust you for it. Bless the gift and giver alike this evening. Now in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Bible this evening. Go to Romans chapter 12 with me, will you please? Romans chapter 12. We're focusing this year on B. B E. What manner of persons ought ye to be? And we're going to, our verse for the month is Romans 12 and verses 1 and 2. And the Bible says in verse 1 I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of the scripture here tonight. And Lord, as we open up your word and we study it together, we pause and we bow before you and Ask the Holy Spirit to help us tonight. Lord, we want to rightly divide the word of truth, and we want the Holy Spirit to teach us this evening. And so, Lord, every believer here tonight, I pray they'll yield themselves to the Spirit of God. And, Lord, you will uh, open our understanding that we'll understand the word and we'll live the word that we understand. So, Lord, help us tonight to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Help me as I bring the study and help the people as they listen. May you accomplish what you would like to accomplish in each one of our hearts. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Why do you, why do you suppose I'm told there are about 100 million church members in America? If that's true, why aren't we making more of an impact than what we are? Why aren't we making more of a moral impact on our country than what we are? Why is it that in, in many churches uh, across the land, there's more empty seats in the auditorium on Sunday morning than there are occupied seats? Thank God that's not the case in this place, but that's, that's usually the case in many places. They say the average Sunday school in America has 66 people in attendance. And the average morning service has 84 people in attendance. Normally, it's, it's kind of expected when you have the, the, whatever your attendance is compared to the number of members on the roll, it's about 50% of the people that actually attend. Why is that? Why is it that, that uh, 
if we believe in a real heaven and a real hell and we believe the Bible's the word of God and we believe Jesus is the only way to heaven, how can we be quiet about it? How can we be so silent and we just keep it to ourselves? I'm going to tell you why. It's, it's pretty simple, really. Many people have made a decision about Jesus, but they've never surrendered to Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? They made a decision for Jesus, but they've never surrendered to Jesus. There's a difference between a decision and surrender. You can see it, hey, you can see it in the in the failure of marriages. Over 50% of marriages end in divorce in America. And that happens because couples make a decision but they never do surrender their lives to live for one another. They just made a decision to be with somebody. They kissed each other, walked down the aisle, but they don't live happily ever after. And why do they divorce? Is because they made a decision, but they never surrendered their lives to each other. The same thing's true in church. How come we have so many church members and people who go to church, but they have no impact in the world? We have no, no godly influence in our society. Why is that? The reason is we've made a decision for Christ, but we've never surrendered our life to Jesus Christ. We're not surrendered. I'm told I'm not a pilot. I'm told that when you're in an airplane and you begin to take off down the runway, that there's a point in time when you have to take off. There's only so far you go where you can abort the takeoff. Once you get so far and pick up so much speed, you got no choice. You got to go. You have uh, you you are you are committed completely. You're you're surrendered completely to the air, or you're going to crash. That's just the way it's going to be. And in other words, there, there's a point in time when you get so far you can't change your mind any longer. You have to go. And and that's surrender to Christ. When there comes a point where you say, I, I I'm not. I can't change my mind. I am completely surrendered to him and I'm going to talk about the difference here in a minute about surrender and commitment I I I think we've we, we've done a great disservice by telling people to make a commitment to Christ instead of using what a Bible word is and which is a surrender to Christ or a yielding to Christ there's a difference between surrender and commitment Okay, uh, surrender, absolute surrender is this, listen, to intentionally and permanently give up and relinquish all control and ownership of everything to Christ. Intentionally and permanently give up and relinquish all control and ownership of everything to Jesus Christ. In other words, surrendering just turning everything we have, everything we are over to God. And saying uh, it's yours, it's it's relinquishing all control of my life to God. That's surrender. The I always like to illustrate it with a, with an ink pen. the The pen is surrendered to one thing, that is, it's supposed to write. Okay. And, of course, being a Bible Baptist church pen, it absolutely will write. And um, <laughs> I don't know for how long, but it will write. And uh, it, it's surrendered to that. Now, the pen, though, has to be surrendered to my hand. If the pen is not surrendered to my hand, it cannot fulfill the purpose for which it was put together. The purpose which was created was to write, but if it doesn't yield to my hand, it can't fulfill its purpose. And you and I, if we are not yielded to the hand of God, will never fulfill our purpose for which he saved us, for which he created us, is that we might be yielded, surrendered to him, for him to do what he wants to do with us. If the pen has its own mind and you go to write it, 
and you're wrestling with this thing, you never get much done. You see, it has to be yielded. And we have to be yielded to God. Maybe, maybe the reason God doesn't get a lot done in our lives is because there's a lot of that going on. Because we won't surrender. We won't be yielded to Him. A commitment is different. A commitment is this. A commitment is a promise, an obligation, or a pledge. While surrender is when you give up and hand over to another person the control, commitment means I'm still in control. Surrender takes me out of the driver's seat. Commitment, commitment is deciding on a plan, but surrender is giving in to God's plan. Committing myself. I, I, surrender says I'm going to do what God wants me to do. Now, you, 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 you won't surrender. When you surrender, you submit yourself to the control of God. You have to take, you have to take, you have to take your hands off the steering wheel. God, I got news for you. God isn't your co-pilot. Okay? God better be your pilot. Okay? You don't, you don't even have to sit in the co-pilot seat. You can go to the back of the plane and enjoy the flight. Because God is the pilot. He'll take care of it. So what, here's, what, here's what the Bible says to do. Look at Romans 12 and verse 1. Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. The first thing we do is we present our bodies. This, this verse is an amazing verse. It has, it has so many theological truths in it. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. And this is what we're doing in response to what God has done for us. And he says... I beseech you, therefore. Now, how many of you know what therefore means in the Bible? Anytime you see the word therefore, you look to see what it is. Therefore, okay? Uh, in the word therefore, what is it there for? And it's therefore based on everything that's gone on in the first 11 chapters. How many of you were in uh, adult Sunday school this past Sunday? All right, so we were. We went over the book of Romans, do you remember? And we talked about the two great divisions in the book of Romans. Chapters 1 through 11, and then 12 through 16. And we talked about how 1 through 11 was all talking about the great doctrines of the Christian faith. And then 12 through 16 was how to live out those doctrines of the Christian faith. And so he's basing it on all these chapter, uh, chapters 1 through 11. He's saying, I beseech you by the mercies of God. And, and this is a exhortation it's I, I used to think that 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 beseech was just like a word beg but it's it's really different than that it's it's a uh, in fact the word is parakaleo uh, it sounds it's very similar to paraclete anybody know what paraclete was that's that's through the Holy Spirit this is parakaleo it's the noun form of the same word that's used for the comforter the Holy Spirit and so he's, he's uh, urging them, he's exhorting them in an exhortation um, to, to, to present their body a living sacrifice. And it's a strong word. And so he's, he's saying, I, I, he's kind of encouraging them. He's, he's like a coach who's trying to urge them and encourage them that they, they need to do this because of the mercies of God. Remember in Romans the first few chapters we talked about it talks about the depravity of man, the sinfulness of man. Man is a sinner, and man is 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 has no hope of whatsoever of being saved. But once you get into chapter three, the end of chapter three, and on through chapter five, and 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 you you find that there's a great doctrine of justification by faith, what Christ has done for us, that we can't save ourselves, but Christ has done it for us. And God has loved us. Why? By the way, if we can't save ourselves and we're helpless and we're hopeless and God sent His Son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins and pay our sin debts so we could have eternal life, hey, my friend, that's mercy. We didn't deserve any of that. That's just God's mercy. He's very merciful to us. It talks about God's mercy in giving us the Holy Spirit who empowers us to grow in the things of God and and, and, and to assure us of our relationship with Him. And in chapters 9, 10, and 11, he, he, he lets us know that God doesn't just love Israel, He loved Gentiles too. 
And, and He loves all of us unconditionally. And, and it's all the mercy of God. Is God merciful to you? Yeah. Is God merciful to us? Yes, He is. Absolutely. And so we, we think of that, that the mercies of God. Now that's interesting because it's, here He is urging them to present their bodies. He's going to urge them to holy living. He's going to urge them to, to live separate lives for God. And the basis He does it on is the mercy of God. The mercy of God. That's not the normal thing you hear when someone wants to talk to you about living holy. They don't usually base it on how merciful God's been to you. But that's what Paul's saying. That's what the Spirit of God is saying through Paul. So the, the Bible's way, the Bible way of preaching holiness begins by reminding Christians, it reminds us that who we are, what we are, and what we have, the mercies of God. By the way, who are we? We're the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. We're children of God. Where are we? We're in the kingdom of God. We are, where are we? We, are, we? we have dominion. We have power over sin. Nobody has, to, if, well, nobody has to let sin have dominion over them as a believer. Christ's given us the power to have victory over that. We have the Holy Spirit of God. What do we have? We have God's Spirit. He empowers us. He helps us. He intercedes for us in prayer. And so we, we see, by the way, we have God's Word. We have all these things God's done for us. Listen, because of that, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's what he's getting to. The best way to motivate people is to show them what God's done for them. I think Paul earlier in Romans said, it's the goodness of God that will lead you to repentance. Just realize how good God's been to you. So he says to present our bodies. Again, in this case, it's interesting when he says present your bodies. It's, it's, it's a glad, happy, willing offering of oneself. This case, in this case, it's not a surrendering. It's a presenting. If I'm going to surrender something to you, or I'm going to present something to you, it takes on a whole different meaning. I'd like to present you with this, and I'd give you something. But if I have to surrender something to you, it's like you're kind of forcing it from me. Right? I'm, I'm giving it up. I'm not freely giving it. But here he says, present your body willingly, freely, gladly, like you give a present to somebody. Present, present your body to the Lord. So we, we give our bodies to God, and it's a sacrifice for his use. God's not asking you. God's not asking me tonight He's not asking us to give Him our abilities and our gifts and our money, our time, our creativity. He's not asking any of that. He's asking us to sacrifice ourselves. That's what He's asking. It's an appeal that those of us who've been saved by the grace of God, saved by the mercy of God, would give ourselves back to Him. That's what He's asking. It's interesting when, over in chapter 14, when it says that every one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The word stand there is the same one that's used for present your body. In other words, every one of us will present ourselves before the judgment seat of Christ. We'll be there to stand before God. And we want to present ourselves willingly. We want to present ourselves uh, faithfully. We're there to get rewards for the things we've done in our body, whether they be good or bad. And so, listen, the way, to, the way to present yourself well then is to present yourself well now. Present your body now, and you won't have any problem presenting it then. And so, that's when the rewards, the rewards will be handed out. Listen, 
Belief impacts behavior. Belief impacts behavior. What you believe will determine how you live. Now, he says, here's how we present our bodies to God. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. So there's three qualities in our sacrifice here. Number one, it's to be a living sacrifice. Did you notice in the Old Testament, folks would be called upon to make a sacrifice. Here, and by the way, it would be a dead sacrifice, obviously. But here we are, we're supposed to be a sacrifice. A living sacrifice. Most, most Christians, in a, in, a, in, a, in a moment of courage, or if it really came down to it, I think you'd take, a, you'd take a bullet for Christ if that was the case. Deny Jesus Christ as your Savior or take a bullet and take the bullet, I'll go to heaven. I'm okay. And most of you would be the same way. But that isn't what he's asking. He's asking us, will you live to die? Every believer struggles with dying to themselves and living for God. Don't, don't think, say, oh, pastor, just pray for me. i got a problem with the flesh. Everybody does? Okay? You're, you're going to be in the, you're, you're going you're gonna to battle that every day. Paul said, Paul, the great apostle Paul, you know what he said? I die daily. Every day I got to battle this thing. Every day I've got to die to the flesh. And he did. Every day you do battle. And every day you are a living sacrifice. The question isn't, will you die for Jesus? The question is, will you live for Him? Will you, will you let Him live through you? Will you die to yourself so He can live through you? That's, that's the question. So we're a living sacrifice. Then it says, holy. Set apart from the world, belonging to God. Again, it's, it's, it's completely set apart for God to use us. That's holy. The things of the tabernacle, the things of the temple were holy. What? They were set apart strictly for the service of God. That's what we're supposed to be. In fact, 1 Peter says, be ye holy as he is holy. God's holy, we're to be holy. We're his. We belong to him. Living sacrifice, holy. Then it says acceptable. Acceptable means it's pleasing to God. In Ephesians chapter 5, it says, proving what is acceptable to the Lord. It doesn't mean that, well, yeah, that's okay, I'll accept that. No, 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 it's, it's that which is pleasing to Him. Do what's pleasing in His sight. And when you, when you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy unto God, that's pleasing to Him. That's pleasing to God. Now, notice what Paul said. When we... Verse 1 again. When we present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Word for reasonable there is logikos, logical. Logical. It just makes sense that you would do that. If I consider all that God's done for me, and I consider all that God has provided for me, and I consider all the things how God's been merciful and loving and kind and gracious to me. It just makes sense. I give myself to Him. That's logikos. It's logical. It's reasonable. Reason. Reason it out. It's, it doesn't make any sense to still serve the old master. Doesn't make any sense to serve. If you if you if you lived in an apartment complex and you had a a horrible owner and and you're renting an apartment from him and he keeps raising the rent and he won't fix anything and there's leaks and there's the heated work sometimes it does sometimes it he won't do anything he keeps man you're just fed up and then you 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 can't find anywhere to go you're just kind of stuck there 
until you hear one day that someone else has bought the complex. Now you have a new landlord. And guess what? Things are getting fixed. And things are working again. And he's keeping the rent right where it should be. And pretty soon, you hear a knock on your door. And it's the old landlord wanting money from you. Are you going to pay him anything? No, you say, hey, you're not my landlord anymore. I don't owe you anything. But wait a minute. You used to serve an old landlord. His name was the devil. You lived your life for him, and he was a hard man. Guess what? You got saved, and you got a new owner. You got a new landlord, and his name's Jesus Christ. And yet, the devil still comes and knocks at your door and demands things from you and tells you things, and guess what? You still believe him. You still listen to him and saying, hey, you don't have anything to do with me anymore. I don't rent from you. I don't belong to you. This is even your property anymore. You have no right in my life. Get out. See? You have that ability. Belief impacts our behavior. Don't go. You have no reason to follow the old landlord anymore. Now, how can I present my body as a sacrifice? Three things. Resolve, number one, resolve to make holiness a priority. Can I help you with something? Holiness isn't something you do on Sunday. Okay? I, I shouldn't say that. You don't just do it on Sunday. Okay? I'm saying don't have to be holy on Sunday. Boy, that'll grow one. No. But you know, you know what? You, listen, the world doesn't get this. They, they, they'll say, every now and then you have a politician that may be an outspoken Christian, and they, they say, well, you know, you, 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 you do that on Sunday, that's fine, but don't bring that into the workplace with you. Well, see, that's impossibility for a, for a true Christian. Because we're not just, this isn't just for Sunday. This isn't just for Wednesday. This, is, this holiness is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's 24-7, 365 days a year. It is, it, is, it is what we are. We are, not, we are not doing holy. We are being holy. It is what we are. And that has to be a priority. And so your worship of God, your time with God, your time spent with God, that, that's not, hey, it's great for the church. It's great for you to be in church. You hear the teaching. You hear the preaching. You fellowship with God's people. That's important. That's necessary. But you need something Monday. And you need something Tuesday, and you need something Wednesday. You know what you need? You need your personal time with God. You and God having your own personal worship time. Your own personal time where He talks to you and you talk to Him. You need that. That has to be a priority. You'll never live holy if you don't make that a priority. Resolve to make it a priority. Every morning, every day, you ought to say, God, I'm yours. God, I'm yours. Because of Jesus, I'm yours. And make that a priority. Number two, uh, seek for ways to serve. Seek for ways to serve. Take the time to visit somebody. Take the time to do something for someone. Pick up the phone and call someone who might be going through a struggle. Take on a project. Ask what, what needs to be done at church or, how can you be a help? What can you be a blessing? Look for ways, just look for ways to help. An idle mind, an idle hand are the devil's workshop. I used to say that. Stay busy. Just keep yourself occupied. You overcome evil with good. You overcome evil with good. You're not going to overcome evil by saying, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. You know what you're going to do? You're going to do that. You know why? It's all you've been thinking about. Best way to not think about it is get busy doing good things and you'll find out, you'll go by four hours, five hours, six hours and think, wow, I didn't even think about that. You know why? You overcame evil with good. So seek for ways to serve. And then the third thing is commit yourself. 
you go like this, to physical exercise. You know why? That's discipline. You want to present your body, you have to subdue your body. How many of you, how many will admit you don't like to exercise? Hmm? Yeah. You know why? That's your body telling you what you're going to do. It's true. I, I, I go to the workout place. At, I'm there at 5 a.m. every morning, every Monday through Friday. I get up about 425 in the morning. And do I want to get up at 425 in the morning? No. The alarm goes off, and I can't believe it's going off. And, and, and sometimes now, you know what? You know what I find out, though? You find out that you can train this body to do that. Now sometimes I wake up before the alarm goes off. And you get up and you go. And, and, and you just, you, the root, remember, the same root word of disciple is the same root word for discipline. So you heard me say this before. Being disciplined doesn't make you spiritual. But being disciplined will make spirituality available to you. If you're not disciplined to get up and read your Bible faithfully in the morning or get up and pray when it's time to pray, if you won't make your body do that, then you'll never be spiritual. You have to be disciplined enough to do that. Then God will work in your heart. God will work in your life. The Word of God will have its effect and you'll, 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 you'll change. God will work in you that which is pleasing in His sight. God works in you that which is His good pleasure. And so, God wants all of us. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So, we're to glorify God in our body. So, uh, let Him have your life. Commit yourself to that. So, that's the what of the command. Present your body as a sacrifice. We go to verse 2, and we have the how. We're to respond to God. And number two is by renewing your mind. Renewing your mind. Presented bodies come from changed minds. Because the mind is supposed to control the body. Again, there's two commands here. that One's negative and one's positive. And he says the first thing is, be not conformed to the world. And the word conform means molded or stamped according to a pattern. Molded or stamped according to a pattern. And it's interesting because the verb that's used is passive. In other words, if you don't do anything, it will stamp its image on you. If you don't do anything, the world will press you into its mold. As much as the world says, be yourself, be an individual, they all want to be alike. Now I want you to think alike. There's a pattern the world wants to fit you into. And Paul is saying, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. And again, not the planet Earth, but the world system. In other words, we, we don't let the thinking of the world become our thinking. The world's philosophy is pretty simple. If you want something, go get it. Whether it's partners or possessions or power. The world's th thinking is pretty simple. People are important because of what they can do for you. When they can't do anything for you anymore, get rid of them. That's what the world thinks. Popularity is more important than holiness. Faith and everyday living are not related. Talking about worldly thinking now. You are the center of your universe. Don't let anyone push you around. Tolerance. Tolerance. Truth is not absolute. Well, it's good for me. I'm not saying it's good for you, but it's okay for me. I, I'm not saying it's not good. If you want to do that, that's okay. That's the world. Actually, was reading something, and I'm not going to say it is because some of you may like them, but uh, I was reading something about a, a couple that's under some fire right now, and he said, I would rather be loving than right. And 
I said, wait a minute. By the way, that's never, that, that's never the choice. Okay? You can be lovingly right. Okay? You don't have to say, I've got to be loving or right. But listen, let's, let's be right. God says there are things that are good and there are things that are evil. And, and the, the, the whole, you know, this whole controversy thing, and, and, and it's about some of the, the, the same gender marriages and those kind of things. And, and folks just want to, even Christians want to be careful and tiptoe around that. I'm not, listen, to say that God's against it is not unloving. It's just truth. It's no different than somebody telling me, and I'm glad somebody told me I was lost on my way to hell. And say, well, how unloving of you to tell me that. Now, I'm glad they told me the truth. Because I, if not, I'd be lost on my way to hell. But somebody was brave enough to love me enough to tell me the truth. And I got saved. And so did you, if, if someone was brave enough to tell you the truth. So you have to be careful. We get shaped by the influences of the world. You don't have to do anything. You just have to not do anything and it'll shape you. And I'll tell you how it does it. How much television you watch this week? What kind of music you're listening to? How many movies are you watching? What kind of websites you read or books or magazines? How much, how much time you spend on social networking? Social media. You see, let me ask you a question. Will one diseased fish affect all the fish in the tank? Yeah, it will. Well, just one cow has mad cow disease. That won't matter to all the rest of them, will it? Yeah, it will. Mm -hmm. you, think, you think one person being affected by the world can have an effect on an entire church? Yeah. Israel, you think just one guy taking some things out of Jericho, can that affect the whole nation? Yeah, it can. It can. So, you have to be willing to be different. You have to be willing to not be squeezed into the mold and you have to do it on purpose you have to say no I'm not going there I'm not listening to that I'm not watching that I'm not going to let that influence my thinking don't go with the flow go against the grain you, the, if you don't you won't be a disciple of Christ beliefs impact behavior now, we go from the negative, not be conformed, not be squeezed into that mold, to the positive, and that is to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Most of you know that transformed word is metamorphosis. It's where we get our metamorphosis from. When a tadpole goes into a frog or a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, we call that metamorphosis. That's what God desires for each of us. Now you, you may be in various stages of that metamorphosis. And we come into the room and there's people in different stages of where that's at. But the, the, the problem isn't what stage you're in, but are you, are you going through the stages? Are you on the growth chart? That's where you want to be. Now, let me give you three observations related to that metamorphosis. The, the, the word, the, the verb usage there about being transformed is in that present continual tense. So it's a continual transformation. In other words, it's not an on-again, off-again thing. Okay? It's a continual thing. And, and it's, this is interesting, because it's a passive verb, which means the catalyst in the transformation process isn't me. It's God. God's the catalyst. It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God wants to transform us. He wants to do a work in us and through us. 
so it's, it's, it's tra- the catalyst in the transformation is God. And then also, thirdly, the verb is imperative, saying that we do have a responsibility, but our responsibility is simply to yield to God, yield to the Spirit. And the Spirit changes us. And you know what happens? He, how does the Spirit change us? You know how he changes us? He renews our mind. He gets us to start thinking differently. Before you were saved, you, you became accustomed to sin. And what happened was, what happens is we, we had thought patterns that run through our head. Okay? And if you, from one place to another, as the thought goes through our head, if you just think about it as wearing a, wearing a groove, same, same thing over the same path, over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, it just wore a groove there. And so when some things happen, bam, it just, it go there, just have to, you wouldn't even have to think about it. It's just automatic. That's what you, that's what you did. And, and that's how you handle things. That's why, listen, the hardest, the hardest part about any, any renewing your thinking is, okay, for those of you who have stopped, for instance, stopped smoking cigarettes, you know the hardest things to do is? To get those groove patterns out of your head. Oh, I just finished dinner. I need to have a, boom, there it is. It's just running that same groove again. And the hard thing is you've got to re- You've got to renew that mind, and you've got to start sending a different thought pattern through your head. See, it's got to put a different groove in your head. And that's, that's, that's uncomfortable at first. That's different at first. You need to make some new grooves, and that takes time. That takes time. But that's how you get transformed. See, that's why, listen, the transformation process goes, you're here on Wednesday night, okay? Because somewhere along the line, listen, when you first got saved, when you first came to know Christ your Savior, and somebody told you, hey, you ought to come to church Wednesday night, how many of you thought, what? <laughs> Wednesday night? How many of you thought that? Huh? Come on, be honest. Uh, whoever heard of going to church on Wednesday night? I mean, Sunday, okay, I got it. But Wednesday, you know what I'm, that, that wasn't a thought, that wasn't any thought in your head. You had to start wearing a new groove that, hey, Wednesday night I go to church. Now, it's such a groove in some of your heads now, you didn't have to even constantly think about it. It's Wednesday, we're going to church. You know why? It's now you got that right groove there. Your mind has been renewed. And now you're thinking properly. Okay? We, we had, when, you remember a few weeks ago, when Leanne wanted a ride to the doctor? Hmm? And we had, we had two, two gentlemen who individually said, oh, we'll, we'll give her a ride. Well, see, you can't do that. You don't, you don't, put, you, you don't go in a car by yourself with someone with an with a opposite gender that you don't call husband or wife. You don't, you don't be alone. You know what you're doing? You're putting temptation and opportunity together. There are, there are uh, preachers, and, and you know, uh, Billy Graham, what's he, 98 years old, 99, he's getting up there. You know, and my wife, we were just talking about him about something the other night, and she said, you know, he's never had a scandal. Not one. But you know what Billy Graham did? Billy Graham never traveled alone. He always took somebody with him. Oftentimes when, when he got a motel room, he got the end room. And he put the fellow traveling with him in the room next to his. Anybody knocked on his door, that guy opened his door to see who it was. You see, what was he doing? Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, never had a scandal. Never had anybody question his motives. But listen, and somebody says, oh, what's the big deal? You, you know what? You just need to wear some new grooves. You just need to get some, renew your thinking. Renew your thinking. 
and get some new thoughts. That's renewing your mind. Now, how does that take place? How can you renew your mind? Let me give you several thoughts. Number one, saturate yourself in godly thinking. Godly thinking. How do you do that? Read God's Word. But it's not just reading. Absorb it. Understand it. Think about it. Interact with God's Word. When you read the Bible, say, okay, what's this mean for me? What's this saying to my life right now? It means you're, you're going to read godly things. It means you're going to listen to good preaching and good teaching. It means you're going to get together in fellowship with other believers who have right thinking. You do become like the people you hang around. Memorize Scripture. Memorize Scripture, number two. Oh, Pastor, I can't memorize anything anymore. Hmm? How old are you? You know, when I ask people that, they tell me right away. How would you remember that? What's, what's the address where you live? They'll tell you that, just like that. Oh, oh, you remember things that are important to you. So if Scripture becomes important enough, you can memorize it. Oh, I, 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 just, I just can't seem to, to... Listen, does God want you to memorize His Word? Do you think he'd help you? Do you think you might ask him? Do you think if you ask him, he'd say, no, I don't want you to memorize my word. I'm not going to help you. Why don't you ask him to help you? And you know, it's not just said not to memorize it, but you know what you do? Read it and 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 read it. You get a verse you want to memorize and just take it, put it on a card, carry it with you for a week, and every day for seven straight days, you read that over about 10, 12, 15 times a day. See if by the end of the week you can't say it. You'd be amazed. Brother Taylor, can I ask you how old are you? How old are you? <laughs> All right, you're, you're, you're heading towards 66? Okay. And been involved now with RU, teaching and such. But he's going through the curriculum, memorizing Scripture. And how do you memorize Scripture? Yeah, he pulled a card out of his pocket right there. That's exactly what he does. If he can do it and he's 66, what's your excuse? It's quiet, isn't it? <laughs> Everybody ready to move on, Pastor. Move on. Move on. Read it, read it, read it, and watch God put it into you. The third thing is to meditate on the Scripture. Slow down, meditate on Scripture. When you just, Psalm 46.10, Be still and know that I am God. I had to laugh today. I read a comment on Facebook about what are you listening to right now? And someone put, well, the TV's on, but I'm not paying any attention to it. I just have to have noise. You ever know people like that? Just noise. You know why? Because if you're still, and it's quiet, your thoughts turn upward. Your thoughts turn upward. Slow down, shut everything off, and think. Meditate. Don't, don't run. Hey, the first time you don't understand something in the Bible, don't run, ask somebody. Think about it a little bit. 
meditate on. The Holy Spirit indwells you. He wrote the book. Ask Him to help you understand that. And meditate on God's Word. You turn off the radio, turn off the cell phone, shut down the computer, turn off the TV, turn off the iPad, the iPod, and all the other eyes, and listen to God. Listen to God. So he tells us then in conclusion, we've got to wrap this up, don't we? That we present our body and renew our mind because he says we'll prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's interesting. He says we prove the will of God. He didn't say we find it or discover it. You can go into most bookstores and you have all kinds of books about finding the will of God or discovering the will of God. The Bible never talks of it in that terms. He said, you prove God's will. Now, he's not dealing with what we would call specific will. Should I live here? Should I live there? Should I take this job? Should I take that job? Should I, what, 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 what should I do? But he's talking here about his general will. That's, that's known to all Christians. His general will is it's spelled out in the Bible. And what you find out, listen to me, Christian, as you do what God's obvious will is or His general will is, you find out that God then reveals to you His specific will. You don't, then it's not a mystery to you. See, when God knows that you're committed and you're surrendered to do His will, and He sees your obedience to doing His will, He'll reveal His will. He'll continue to show you specifically what His will would be concerning you. But if you're refusing to obey His general will, what is obviously that He's written in His Word, why would He go on to share with you specific will for your life? You're not interested in proving it. You're interested in deciding whether you want to do it or not. So if you obey, if you obey what these two verses had lay out for us, God's will finds you. You don't find it. God wants your body and your mind. He wants, he wants all of you. Now the question tonight is this. Is there anything you're withholding from God? Is your is your family yielded to Him? Is your marriage yielded to Him? Your finances, are they yielded to Him? Your, your hobbies, are they yielded to Him? Will you, will you consciously present yourself to God a living sacrifice? And do it consciously every day? If you will, the Bible says God is He's pleased with that. And you will find and you will prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, we bow before you now tonight. Thank you, Lord, for Romans 12, 1 and 2. Wow, so much in these verses. Thank you, Lord, for everyone's attention tonight. Lord, I pray that each of us would leave this place in a few moments and say, God, I'm leaving tonight. And on the fourth day of January, 2017, I'm presenting my body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. It's reasonable, it's logical for me to do that. And I will not be squeezed into the mold of the world, but I'll let you transform me. Bring about that metamorphosis and make me into another creature that I can prove what's the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Father, allow us to impact our world by presenting ourselves to you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm going to finish praying in just a minute. I'm not going to have an invitation. 
But I wonder if tonight how many folks would just say, Pastor, when you close in prayer, remember me. I want to present my body a living sacrifice. I want God to use me to impact my world. I want to not be conformed. I want Him to transform me. I need my mind renewed that I might do His will. Pastor, pray for me tonight. Would you slip your hand up? Amen. Amen. Wonderful. God bless you. You may put them down. Father, you've seen the hands lifted tonight. Thank you, Lord, for people who listen to the Spirit of God and respond to Him. And I pray, God, now your Spirit would work in us and work through us that which you desire for each one of us. Lord, may we consciously remember to present ourselves to you every day. We do it willingly. We do it gladly for all you've done for us. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your mercies. I pray, Lord, we leave this place mindful that you're with us and that others would see Christ in our life this week. And we'll thank you for what you'll do. And I pray it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Hey, take your songbook tonight. We're going to sing a different song. 128. 128. You got a book up here? Thank you. 128. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. Let's try it. Ready? The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garments. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven. Watch it. That's why I'm happy. That's why you're happy. And that's why we're happy tonight. You got it? One more time. Ready? The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garments. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven. And that's why I'm happy. That's why you're happy. That's why we're happy tonight. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Thanks for being here.